Hi, my name is Tracy Jacobs, and I'm the director of the OSHA Lifelong Learning Institute at Towson University. And I want to welcome you to the preview of spring classes. Our classes begin on March 6th. Registration starts on February 14th, which is Valentine's Day. But if you miss it on Valentine's Day, that's okay. It's still time to register up through the beginning of the first week and beyond, as long as there's room in the class. So hurry up and register as soon as possible. You'll find information about registration on our website, which is www.towson.edu slash OSHER. That's also where you'll find the full catalog, the schedule, and information about membership. We have our classes meeting Mondays and Fridays online via Zoom. And then the rest of the week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we have our classes meeting in person. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. The best way to get in touch with the OSHER staff is by emailing osher at towson.edu. And we will respond to your questions as soon as we can. Um, thank you very, very much to our instructors who uh, recorded their preview descriptions of their classes. And I wanna thank you for joining us to learn more about OSHER. And um, I hope we have some new members and some not so new members coming to us and taking classes this spring. We can't wait to see you. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Lisa Wozniki, and I'm a retired professor and librarian from Towson University. This April, I will be teaching my very first OSHER course. Did you ever wonder when you were back in high school, as you looked around the walls of your music classroom, why there were no posters of women composers? Or maybe when you were in college and you took an introductory music history class, your textbook only profiled male composers, giving the impression that there were no women composers that existed. I am here to tell you that that is certainly not the case as women have been composing music since antiquity. In my course, we will look at the reasons why, until recent decades, the works of women composers have existed in the shadows of the fame bestowed to their male counterparts. We will look at the obstacles these women faced, but more importantly, celebrate their achievements and explore their glorious music. We will focus on three Romantic era composers, who from Germany, Fanny Mendelssohn Hensel and Clara Wieck Schumann, along with the incomparable American Amy Beach. We will not only discuss the aspects of their lives and go over biographical details, but we will watch performance concert videos to explore their music. I will provide you with reading lists as well as streaming links to databases so that you can explore this engrossing topic outside of class. Thank you so much for listening to me talk about my course, and I very much hope that you will join me in April. Thank you. Hi, my name is Howard Cohn. My class will illuminate the work and studio processes of four prominent glass artists to excel at storytelling. Their pieces are beautiful, provocative, captivating, and compelling. Whether it's the work of Christina Bothwell, exploring the relationship between mother and child or her two twin daughters, or indigenous artist Preston Singletary, who creates unique interpretations of his tinglet myths and legends. Their sculptures draw you in as you attempt to decipher the fascinating stories and narratives that led to their creation. Recently, Singletary's work Raven in the Box of Daylight was featured on CBS's Sunday Morning. We'll also explore the work of an artist who always brings a smile to my face, Dr. Joyce Scott. Joyce repositions craft as a potent and expressive platform for her social commentary. To do that, she combines beaded and blown glass forms that vilify and illustrate the horrors of slavery, rape, misogyny, and racism. Recently, I was really lucky to work very closely with Joyce. 
I had an opportunity to co-curate and bring a glass exhibition to Coppin State University. So in her honor, I'd like to leave you with a few bars of a song that she always sings. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. So my intention is to share my insights into the inspiration that fuels each artist's creativity and also to illuminate the complex and numerous techniques they use to create their art. I hope you'll join me. Thank you very much. Hello, this is Michael Saltzman. It's good to be with you again. Uh, you may recall that we covered abstract expressionism last spring. And this year, we're going to be talking about one of the two most important movements that replaced abstract expressionism, which is minimalism. Pop art was much more popular uh, and it certainly grabbed a greater part of the art market, uh, but minimalism was much more interesting from a philosophical point of view. There are four lectures as usual. We're going to look at the precursors of minimalism, uh, which include uh, some discussion of what the international style looked like in architecture and what New York looked like uh, to the young artists who would be pioneering uh, this new movement. Uh, and we will close the first lecture uh, by discussing in detail uh, the uh, art of Frank Stella, who was the painter uh, who inspired uh, minimalism as a movement. The second lecture is going to be about the major object makers. The minimalists were by and large makers of objects, that is to say, three-dimensional things that were halfway in many ways between paintings and sculptures. And their leader, Donald Judd, did not want to call the pieces sculptures. He called them objects. And the leaders were Judd and Andre, Dan Flavin, Saul Lewitt, Robert Morris, and Fred Sandback. And they will get most of the time uh, of that lecture. There were also California artists who were uh, doing minimalism, and we'll talk a bit about them uh, and the feminists who got involved. And in lecture three, we will talk about the African-American artists uh, for the first time who followed minimalism uh, with post-minimalist discoveries and experiments uh, in the way contemporary painting and objects were going to look. And then finally, uh, after we discussed the birth of conceptual art and earth art and happenings, all sorts of things that came out of minimalism, in the final lecture, we're going to talk about the after effect of minimalism and post-minimalism on the art that is made today. Uh, and once again, we're going to be talking about a wide variety of artists from a wide variety of backgrounds. So I'm really looking forward to doing minimalism reconsidered, different from the way we used to talk about in past years. And I hope to see you there uh, as a part of our conversation. Thank you. Hello, my name is Makita Brotman. I'm a writer, a psychoanalyst, and a literature professor at MICA, the Maryland Institute College of Art. I like to teach literature classes with a psychoanalytic angle. Um, last summer, in the second four-week summer session, I taught a class on Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. This year, in the second week summer session, four-week summer session, I'm going to teach a class on another controversial 20th century novel, Nabokov's Lolita from 1955. Nabokov himself described this novel as a love affair with the English language. However, for a while, it was considered simply uh, an underground erotic novel about a middle-aged man's perverted obsession with a young child. Since then, it's been reclaimed as a virtuosic masterpiece written in the elegant and anguished voice of a sexual criminal. 
we'll be looking at the novel's style, themes, history, and critical reception. I hope you can join me for what I'm sure will be an interesting class. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having the courage to even consider registering for a class about the D word. As you know, in our culture, we tend to avoid, at least at a conscious level, the topic of our mortality. For most of us, sitting with a group of people and having an open, honest conversation about death would be a rather unusual experience. For some, it may represent the very first time they have spoken in any detail about their own death. But I want to assure you that this class is nothing to be afraid of. In fact, just the opposite. Many people find that having the opportunity to clarify their own thoughts and beliefs about death, a chance to reflect upon how those thoughts and beliefs were formed, and an opportunity to listen to the perspectives of other people is actually an antidote for death anxiety. Memento Mori was a salutation used by hermits in France in the 16th century as a way of reminding each other to live their best lives in this very moment because death can arrive when you least expect it. We will be discussing various topics related to death and dying, including how to prepare for our death practically, emotionally, and spiritually, what happens when we die, some of the ways we defend against our existential fear of death, our preference for how and where we will die, whether our beliefs about death have evolved over time, and if so, how, and how acceptance of our mortality and making peace with the inevitability of our death can actually enhance our relationships and even add joy and meaning to our lives. No one's beliefs will be judged in this class and all perspectives and opinions will be honored and welcomed. Just a caveat, this class may not be appropriate for someone who is in the midst of acute grief. Feel free to contact me through Tracy if you have any specific questions. Thank you and memento more. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The Pledge of Allegiance I just recited is not the original pledge. Fact. The pledge has been revised several times since its creation in the late 19th century. Fact. The revisions made over the decades represent the values of all American citizens. No, not a fact. Yet, that statement is of great value because it welcomes us as citizens to see the pledge more closely and to share our interpretations of its meaning. The Pledge of Allegiance is at the heart of a short piece of historical fiction we will read that challenges us to discuss big concepts such as honor, conformity, faith, and independence. With each short work we consider, add the power of related poetry, short film, and editorial cartoons, and you find yourself joining a conversation bubbling up from big ideas that intersect across centuries and genre. Whether we are delving into a Walt Whitman poem, Maya Lin's Vietnam Memorial, Shakespeare's first scene of King Lear, or a Kevin Callagher editorial cartoon, we will always keep our eye on this controlling idea that all artistic expression springs from history, that the arts and history are windows through which we see the world and mirrors in which we see ourselves. Hello, my Osher friends. The 19th century German philosopher, Arthur Schopenhauer, is one of the more intriguing thinkers in the history of Western thought. His intellectual range was impressive in that he was well-versed in philosophy, literature, science, and the fine arts. Reading Schopenhauer today, we see that his work foreshadowed some important insights of Nietzsche, Darwin, Freud, and Einstein. That being said, Schopenhauer is most famous for his radical extreme pessimism. No philosopher has expressed 
such a deep and vindictive hatred of life and the human species. Now, something is very odd about this. Although Schopenhauer pontificates on the horrors of life, he himself leads quite a lovely and charmed existence. So the question arises, is Schopenhauer being intellectually honest with us? That's something we need to investigate. So if you want to join me in having some fun deciphering the philosophy of Schopenhauer, please register for the class. Thank you for your consideration. Hello, everyone. My name is Father Bob Albright, and I am teaching a course called The Easter Narratives of the New Testament in the Bible. Now, why would I choose such a topic for such an eclectic group of Osher students? Because we all share something in common. We will all die. Everything and everyone around us dies, and we too will eventually die. Some of the most persistent questions I have been asked as a pastor and a teacher over the past 50 years have to do with death. Is there a heaven? Father, do you believe in hell? Do you think there is an afterlife? What do you think happens to us when we die? What I answer to these questions is of no consequence. What is of consequence can be found in the great sages and seers of the present and past, and the great works of faith and revelation, such as the Bible, the Upanishads, the Talmud, the Kabbalah, and the Quran. Now, since I am a student and a teacher of the Bible, I choose to deal with these questions through that medium. So, we shall examine the texts of the Bible that speak of one of the most puzzling mysteries ever told, that of resurrection from the dead. The faith of the early Jewish Christian church, found in all four Gospels and the letters of St. Paul in the New Testament portion of the Bible, that Jesus of Nazareth, a first century Jew, rose from the dead and sits at the right hand of God. In Christian parlance, we call that Easter. Therefore, join me for a rip-roaring eight weeks of scholarly study, questions, doubts, certainties, speculation, exegesis, hermeneutics, faith, fact, fiction, and mystery as we study the Easter narratives of the New Testament. Thank you. I'm Ellen O'Brien, and I'd like to talk to you about King David. Yes, the David who killed Goliath, allegedly, and the David who had an affair with Bathsheba, that is after he had her husband killed in the front line of battle. And so all of our information on the historical King David will be based on the latest archeological evidence, scientific findings, and the precise words from the books of Samuel and Chronicles. Now, do you remember that childhood nursery rhyme that went rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief? doctor, lawyer, merchant chief. Well, let's update it a little bit to include David's lives. Rich man, poor man, traitor, thief, killer, adulterer, liar, chief. Yes, David is a very complex and complicated man, but you don't get to have your descendants hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later, known as coming from the house of David, unless you were ambitious, aggressive, assertive, and angry. 
adjectives that normally aren't used for that sweet young man who played the harp for King Saul to help him get rid of his headaches. So let's look at David. Warts, faults, power hungry, and all. A very interesting, complicated, and they say, handsome man. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bill Berry, and I'm excited to be back with OSHA this spring for another go round of modern labor history. It's an exciting time in labor history today with organizing campaigns at Amazon and Starbucks, uh, with the complicated negotiations that the railroad unions are going through, which involves everybody up to the President of the United States. As a large part of the class will be about current events, and we will particularly have guest speakers from campaigns like Amazon, Starbucks, uh, the railroads. But we'll also go back in history to about 1980, to one of the low points of the union movements when a former local uh, international union president was elected president of the United States and immediately started to eliminate the union movement by firing the air traffic controllers. We will take this as a low point and see how the unions have progressed. We will look at the changes in the economy, the incredible transformation of the global economy. We will look at the impact of COVID on our workplaces. And we will look at your experiences as participants in the class to see how your lives and your work experiences and those of your families have changed. We will look at the union movement as it tries to rebuild itself and it's almost new developments every day that we will follow. So we really look forward to seeing you. It's going to be an exciting time. We have, as I said, some great guest speakers lined up. And I look forward to seeing you. Hello, my name is Dr. Bob Baer, and this spring I'm going to be teaching the pioneers of women's rights in America. Now, the 19th century America witnessed the beginning of a movement among women to challenge traditional limitations, push for new opportunities, and promote equal rights. This course will explore the first generation of women's rights supporters. Groundbreaking women against tremendous odds made great strides towards creating a more equal society in America. We will explore the contributions of women to break down barriers in politics, education, law, religion, labor, and in social relations. Women to be discussed will include some that you've heard of and probably many that you have not. Women such as Susan B. Anthony, Margaret Fuller, Fanny Wright, Lucy Stone, Ida B. Wells, Sojourner Truth, Clara Barton, Victoria Woodhall, and many others. We will also include some early male uh, supporters of women's rights, such as Frederick Douglass. So I hope you can join me in this class this spring. I'm sure that most of you have heard about critical race theory, but many of you are probably not sure exactly what it is and what it isn't. So I'm gonna begin the class by explaining some of the major principles that critical race theorists use. Then I want to provide some historical context for the current controversy. Uh, for example, one could go back to the Civil War and show examples of banning uh, books, and also in the 1970s and 80s. And finally, I want to show how critical race theory has been weaponized by the American right wing to try to turn back the clock to some of the uh, modest progress that has been made in the last several decades. I'll also allow 15 to 20 minutes of each class for questions and discussion so we could all learn from one another. I look forward to seeing you in class. Hello, my name is Jack Burkert. 
I teach a series of programs called Baltimore Narratives. For the spring season, we've added some new and some interesting topics to our usual offerings. I'll be presenting a series of eight programs that will detail Baltimore history by the decade. The series of eight sessions, Baltimore Narratives, begins in March. From the early days of the 19th century, we go through the 19th century and into the 20th century, each decade up to 1970. We introduce you to the life and times of the citizens of Baltimore, what was going on here, the presidential nominating convention of 1912, the hidden stay tactics of the Berrigan brothers, all of those kinds of things will be part of our uh, series of eight sessions uh, on the Baltimore narratives, Baltimore history part of the programming. I look forward to having you join us for these programs. I'll do my best to make sure that your time, the time you invest in the programs, is well worth the effort. Thank you very much and hope to see you in the spring. Bye now. Did you ever wonder why there is something instead of nothing? You're in front of your computer watching this video being streamed as a bunch of electrons coming through the internet pipes. Electrons, those things that have a negative charge and whose flux enables most of humanity's activities these days, and still exist, when they could have disappeared in a primordial zoo that will also have positively charged particles. An eminent scientist remarked around the beginning of the last century that in the future, we already knew what was to be known. That was six years before quantum mechanics, 11 before relativity explaining why trains might arrive at a different time than scheduled if the platform is moving, 30 years before the expanding universe, and then nylon antibiotics, disentangling DNA, structure of the proteins, extrasolar planets, dark energy. We are still asking where we came from, where we are going as a species, and also as inhabitants of the universe. Where is nature evolving and how it works? We have many answers, but there are still details that need to be understood, and also difficult questions that we don't even know how to ask. I hope you join me while we explore this known and unknowns these answers and these questions. We'll look at the three minutes after a primordial event and jump 13 billion years to come back and ponder how and why there may be something rather than nothing. No equations, no hand waving, no magic, just curiosity. The progress of human endeavor. Like almost at no time before, we have changed our thoughts about what is out there and how the universe works. It is the golden age of astronomy, and Baltimore is at its center as the Hubble Space Telescope and the James Webb Telescope's operational joysticks are just right here. It goes beyond astronomy as the tools and techniques developed to schedule the observations, reduce and analyze the resulting data, are also being used in novel ways to optimize hospital services, map the human genome, perform non-invasive surgery, or very early detection of diseases. We will look at the results of Hubble and Webb and all the other incredible machines on the ground and in space that detect from gravitational waves to microwave and X-ray radiation to cosmic rays that observes from the most beautiful objects to the most powerful explosions. We will learn what we will be built next and ponder on what other wonders we will discover from these upcoming gigantic observatories on the ground and in space, and also how you can be part of this adventure. There is a hell of a good universe next door. Let's explore it. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Guillermo Urle, and I will be teaching in the spring a four-week session on uh, understanding uh, wireless technology. As you know, wireless technology is something that uh, we can't live without. We uh, use it all the time. Uh, I'm using it right now to record this video. Uh, we get into Wi-Fi to access the internet. We use our cellular phones for everything. Uh, we use Bluetooth to connect our speaker and other devices to our computer or to our cars. Uh, and it's all around us. Uh, we tap our credit cards when we, when we make a purchase. 
all of that is wireless technology, but very few of us have a deeper understanding of, of, of the theory behind it, how it works, what are the principles, uh, how it may affect us, uh, our health, uh, in, in, in some instances or, or some applications. Um, and uh, so I will go try to dive a little bit into those issues. We will first explain the basic principles behind it in very simple terms for everybody to understand. Then we'll go a little bit into the history, the major milestones of wireless technology, how we got here. And then we'll go into cellular technology or the different versions of uh, 1G, 2G, uh, all the way to 5G. And, uh, and also into uh, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and a few other uh, short range technologies. So uh, there is a little bit of technical content in the class, but I will explain everything in very simple terms. So I, I'm sure you will all understand it and then get a better foundation of what this is all about. So I hope to see you there and uh, thank you very much for watching this video. Hi, I'm Ann Farrell. I'm teaching a class in the second session of the spring semester entitled Personalized Medicine, Shaping the Future of Healthcare. In the past courses that I've done over the last decade at Osher, we've talked almost solely about national issues, what's happening with the president, the Supreme Court, and Congress. This course takes a completely different look at us inside each individual and what makes us unique. Even though we share 99.9% .9 of our DNA with everybody else on the planet, we're going to look at some genetic analysis, particularly that's sprung up after the 2003 Human Genome Project that provided all kinds of information about how to prevent, treat diseases, and basically extend our longevity potentially. We're going to discuss how these genetic enhancements have spun off a clinical model called precision medicine or personalized medicine that's highly controversial and yet some have seen as the inevitable future. If you've ever asked yourself, can I inherit cancer? Can I change my genes at this point in life to make things better for my prospects of getting diseases? And why do different people having the same problem take the same medicine and have different results? If you're curious about this or other issues with genetics and how that impacts you as a consumer, please come to class. We know that older Americans have more chronic diseases and cancer peaks its incidence in their 80s. So I would think a lot of older Americans would be fascinated by this information as I have. So welcome to class.